sitting down with No Kagan himself, the legend, running a quarter billion dollar yeah. empire over the last decade or so. That's why I try to encourage people to do things in the now. I've literally sent an e-newsletter every single week, maybe for about 15 years. My goal for this book is to have a thousand reviews. I'm not joking. I have a list of a thousand people with names, so they can say it sucked. I think the book's really good, but if they said it sucked, that's okay. But at least they left the review that they, they said they would. And for me, I really wanted to have my own business. I didn't want to work for Zuckerberg. I got fired that day and just like, what am I going to do? I'm so embarrassed. I was just more embarrassed than anything. I've already created content for so many years and started all these businesses and all these things. And this is probably one of the most interesting things in, in professional life, which is like the things that are really impressive and work people just think are actually really easy and fun. Sitting down with No Kagan himself, the legend. He just recently wrote a book, Million Dollar Weekend. Absolutely loved it. Dude. Congrats. Thank you so much. That's a lot of work. And <laughs> yeah. uh, you've also built eight multi-million dollar businesses over the last decade or so. 20 years. All right, so you've been around the block. I've been doing this for a little while. So read the book, and I'm curious, just right off the jump, you know, one of the kind of, it seemed the main parts of the book is that anyone really could build a million dollar business in a weekend. Like, really? <laughs> like anyone? <laughs> yes, yes. The, the reality is that more ordinary people get rich than people realize. Mm. And if you look at my YouTube channel, you'll actually, if you see all the billionaires and millionaires I interview, it's basements, courts, like tabletops, whatever the hell that is. It's shipping, right. right? It's clothing. It's all these other businesses that, you know, I come from Silicon Valley, work directly for Zuckerberg, help build mint.com. I thought you only get rich in tech. Like that's all I knew. And it's been so amazing with uh, the YouTube channel just to be able to meet all these different types of people. Yep. And then through through the book, there's a, a guy named Pat who's in customer support, but now he has a $10,000 a month YouTube agency. Wow. There's a guy named Oliver who has an ice cream stand. <laughs> and it, it's, it, the reality is that there's generally just a few fears and we can talk about in the book. That, that hold people back from actually getting going. And it doesn't mean you need to be a Silicon Valley elite. You just need to actually get started today. And, that, and that's generally what, what holds most people back is how do I get going right now? Yeah. And I like the idea of like building a business is more of a conversation than it is necessarily just coming up with some epiphany idea. Yeah, you, know, you bring up the example in the book of the gentleman that uh, just started holding the line for people for like different sneaker drops <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that and is doing like 80k i think a month just off of having him and his group of other 30 other friends just holding the line yeah um as uh, people wait for the given drop you know it's really more about like kind of scratching your own itch and just seeing what problems you're dealing with in a given day than thinking that just some night you just come up with this epiphany per se which i think is kind of the illusion that most people are under most people think there's like a golden idea that happens and the, the golden idea is the one that you start right now Mm -hmm. Right. Like think about someone got rich building this cap. Mm -hmm. Someone got rich building this like wood panel. Right. These these LED backlights. Right. Like and then you start thinking, oh, I could just do lawn care. Like you just you, yeah. the, literally the amount of things you can get rich on is unbelievable. Once you start realizing that everything can be an opportunity, it's it's finding something you actually enjoy. Like I, I'm getting rich, like making videos and hanging out with you. And then like interviewing people I like and promoting software deals, like it, it's all available for everyone out there. Yeah, what a time to be alive. It's a great, dude, There's it's all free too. My favorite price. Yeah. You know, that you can go out, <laughs> post on any of these social media for free, collect their emails on SendFox or any of these services you want to do for free. And then there's Stripe or PayPal, Venmo, whatever, completely free. And you can actually build, you know, six, seven, eight figure businesses with very little upfront capital, very little time. It's a great time to be rich. It's interesting too, you know, like your story, I think is really inspiring. You know, people could see the fact that you're running this quarter billion dollar plus empire now and think, you know, this is out of reach. I need to raise money. You know, I need, yeah. you know, how, how am I going to do that? Um, but it's fascinating to hear, you know, your story way back. Um, you got fired by Zuck. Um, and, you know, I really relate to uh, a bit, a lot of that story. You know, I've had, I was fired uh, from an early job that I had started. Congrats. And, yeah, exactly. Right. And. <laughs> Uh, the amount of like shame and the amount of just depression, anxiety, like, you know, self-worth issues that that caused for a little part of my life was almost at some points like unbearable, hardly get out of bed. It sounded like for you, it's hard to get off the couch there even for six months and just figure out what the heck are you going to do with your life and kind of replaying those scenarios over and over again in your head. What could I have done differently? What happened? You know, and it sounds like though that was the start of something beautiful in your journey. Um, would love to learn a bit more about, you know, what was going on there and how did you kind of pick yourself back up after such a, you know, borderline traumatic experience? I know I was, that's traumatic. You know, that was, uh, that was living at a house with six other Facebook guys. That was being very public that I worked at this company that was basically seven, seven days a week at the office. Uh, and so then to have that taken from me was, was, a uh, was very painful. Mm. 
you know, and everyone goes through it. Oh yeah. It's actually a blessing. Like if you can get fired, try to do it like right quick, <laughs> you know, really quickly in your career and build and, a million dollar business in a weekend and get fired in a day. Let's go. Yeah. Get fired quick and then build a business. And, <laughs> and you know, having, having a chip on the shoulder puts chips in your pocket. You know, that that's yep. having this kind of someone doubting you or someone not giving you what you believe you deserve. And yeah, it was, it was traumatic, man. And, and I think everyone needs to go through that and then realize that they, that we are really resilient. Right. That we can, like yourself, myself, like build ourselves back up. And But I think that the bigger thing is also just figuring out what you really want. And for me, I really wanted to have my own business. I didn't want to work for Zuckerberg. I didn't want to, I don't know, go to some office in Silicon Valley, even though I didn't really want to. And I will say, though, no, it's easy now, 15 years, 15 years later, 18 years later. But it, it sucked, dude. It really sucked. You know, I, I moved out of that. So I, like, I got fired that day. Had a turn back. In, I didn't have a phone because it was a company phone. So I had to go to the Verizon store to make a phone call to my girlfriend. Oh my gosh. Which was like insanely embarrassing. Then I bought a pack of Marlboro Reds. Then I went back to the house I lived with all the people, started smoking cigarettes on the balcony and just like, what am I going to do? I'm so embarrassed. I was just more embarrassed than anything. Yeah. And, and frustrated and disappointed in myself. And you're 23 and you're like, dude, this is the best thing I'll ever find. And you told all your friends and everyone's oh, every, aware. Oh, everyone. If you go to my blog. company at the time. And it was like, yeah. very cool at the time. And then it's not only that, it, it went on to get even more popular. Right. You know, then he goes on Oprah. <laughs> then they buy Instagram. You know, then they do all the, buy WhatsApp. And then Facebook becomes, a, it has a billion users, which is yeah. what we expected. And I, I'm lucky because I, I did get to learn a lot. I'm lucky because I got to be associated and I got to understand what hyper growth is. I got to be around excellence. And that's something, if everyone gets a chance to do it, always take mm -hmm. it. Like if you can go on the flight, go for it. If you can make it a good story, go for it. And that that was my, my time at Facebook. And when I was just, I basically went to my friend Johnny's house and I just lived on his couch for a while. You know, 23 years old, not sure what's going to come next. And, and that was it, was, it was shitty. There's not like a simple answer there. There's yeah. not like some beautiful thing. But, you know, Joseph Campbell, a hero of a thousand faces, the, the thing, he's got a great documentary on, on YouTube. It's basically like, what's your own hero's journey? Yeah. You know, what, what is your hair's journey? Mine was just like, well, I'm going to just be a victim for a long time. <laughs> I'm just going to complain and blame these other people from taking something from me. Yeah. And over time, though, I, I think I I went to uh, a business coach, a life coach. Mark Pinkus recommended her to me. And I just kept swinging. Mm -hmm. I think that's the real big difference. It wasn't that I, and, and this is why we say ordinary people get rich every day. It's not that I had some superpower that's not accessible. And we talk about it in Million Dollar Weekend. Most people are here. Most people want to be here. And it's actually a closer gap mm -hmm. than people realize. Most people are actually having a better life than they realize. That's, that's the beginning. But where they are and where they can, can dream of is actually probably much closer. And I just was so frustrated about it all for, for a very long time. And I think the key part that, that everyone can really relate to and take away from is I did just keep swinging though. Yeah. I just kept going. Like I just didn't quit there. And I think that would have been an easy place to uh, go back to Intel, have health insurance, which my parents were really adamant of being about me quitting Intel to go to Facebook. They're mm -hmm. like, I don't know why you'd quit Intel. It's such a good job. Everyone knows Intel, this Facebook, no one knows this company and that their health insurance may not be as good. And I was like, Mima, I got it. Don't worry. But I just kept going at it. And I kept having a dream of like, I want $3,000 a month and I want to work in Thailand. I just don't, and I don't want to have any boss. I want someone telling me what to do. Yeah. And um, yeah, it took a long time. I tried building events, Community Next. I tried building entrepreneurs27.org, collegeup.org, like a Craigslist for college students. Uh, I tried just so many different businesses and then it, they didn't work, didn't work. And it, it just kept, but I kept staying in it. Right? And yep. I think that that's the big differentiator that eventually led me to, to get AppSumo going, which has been such a blessing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of these like common myths or these things that we get kind of programmed on growing up, like getting fired is bad or getting, you know, <laughs> yeah. no is a bad thing. Like, why did you not close that deal? Like you got no 10 times, like you suck. Or, you know, you quit that job, like, oh my God, you quit? Like, that's horrible. What are you doing? Yeah. And really, I mean, it, it's interesting how you then finally kind of go through the journey. You can look back on it 20 years later and go, actually, you know what? Those are some of the best things that ever happened to me. You know, I, I got started selling craft dinner to a territory of like 20. What's a craft dinner? Craft dinner, like uh, macaroni and cheese. Oh, like the boxes? Yeah, like I would manage like a territory of like 20 stores when I was 19, doing that and just going to one store after the other, managing like their craft, you know, mac and cheese displays and making sure that those things were full and that they were optimizing their total mac and cheese sales in a given location. And the amount of people that would see you pull up 
in a stupid little van and go like, what the hell are you doing here, dude? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> and thinking about your time, man, I'm just getting straight no's from these store managers. But later on, looking back on my experience, you know, those rejections, those no's, that ability just to show up and sell some stuff. And at that time, stuff I didn't even care about, um, you know, ended up being really invaluable as I kind of got older and you're selling stuff that's your own. Oof. And still having to deal with a lot of no's, but somebody you talk about in the book, this idea of like, you know, a thousand no's is actually an accomplishment in many senses. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how it's like helped yeah. your career? Yeah. You know, you see a lot of people, there's a guy, Rico Glover, who read Million Dollar Weekend, and he hits me up today, and he's like, I did the coffee challenge, which, you know, it's one of the things I'm famous for, which is asking for 10% off when you buy coffee. And we give scripts, and I give, you know, other examples in the book of things people can do. And he's like, I didn't know I could face my fears. And it's turning these fears into actually learning opportunities. Because, like, yeah. right now, if you think about fears as, like, a negative, but what if this rejection and fear is actually a positive? And so how do you, how do you change that mindset? How do you change the playing field? And... My father and my mother, growing up, I was just overloaded to seeing them always get rejected. Like my father, I was talking to my mom earlier today. My father tried to return silverware from their wedding 30 years later. Legend. My, you know, it's like 30 years later, they go to Macy's. They're like, this is not, I, where is this from? And the reality is that it's not an exclusive skill that that's only available for me or certain people. It's just something that needs to be practiced. Mm and practiced in safe areas so that you can do it in, in bigger areas. And I always, I like the compliment challenge. That's one of my new ones that I've been telling others I do. I don't realize I even do it, but it's that moment where I have three seconds to negotiate. You know, everyone has it. You know, the three seconds where you could like send the email or three seconds to push the, put the post out or three seconds to like tell that person something. So for me, if someone's wearing clothing, I like, I just, it's my girlfriend's like, you're going to do that. Aren't you? I'm like, oh yeah. So I go up to someone. I'm like, I like your shoes. And I did it uh, a few days ago. This guy had a good jacket. He's like urban outfitters. I was like, thanks. Bye. And so it's practicing the asking and realizing it's not as scary as we think. And as we get better at it, it's like, oh, wow, what other things can I ask? Because, you know, and, and what I've realized is like, you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, I feel, um, you know, a lot of times like building the businesses, you kind of, you realize that if you don't ask, like, yeah, nothing's going to happen. Like you just got to put yourself out there or <laughs> yeah. else nothing's going to move. And there's no secret to it other than just ask. Yeah, you I, get comfortable with that. You talk about it being similar like a muscle. It really you know, is. And just keep flexing that thing and putting yourself out there, getting embarrassed, getting rejected. I like the way though, that you've kind of flipped it on a script. Cause I feel the same way. I feel like, uh, that the importance of sort of fun and play yeah. doesn't get talked about enough in business. It's sometimes, you know, the path so of an scary. entrepreneur. Yeah. It's a scary thing. It's hard. It's this grind hustle, all this kind of stuff. When really, you know, you can flip that on its script, kind of like you can flip the fear on it's just make too. it fun yeah man yeah. make it a game of like you know i'm gonna you know ask for a discount on the coffee i'm gonna compliment this person randomly and just kind of try to play with it more well i mean you there's a the great coach from jim Rohn. it's like it doesn't get easier you just get better hmm. you just get better and so when i you know i've done these i've asked stayed outside a private airport asking someone to go on the private jet i've asked first class passengers what they do for a living ask people i knock on someone's doors that i don't know you can see all these you know yacht owners and it's still uncomfortable it's not like it's easy it's just like Okay. And so the way I look at it is I, I flip it to, okay, this is a game and I'm going to try to get 10 rejections. So I'm out there and I'm like, well, I've only got five. I need to get five more rejections. And then the surprising thing when you ask is you, you get, and these people, Jan opens her door to me and explains how they're now worth eight figures because of selling strawberries or Michael Hudner, who is a, a person I met recently where I just asked him on the street in New York, what he does for a living. And he sells oil tankers. I ended up a month ago to, after I met, I met him two years ago on the street to a month ago, I flew out to Rhode Island and interviewed him. And I went sailing with him on his boat. Wow. Right. And so turning it maybe into such a, a bad thing, make it a good thing. And one of the things that someone recently had a, a breakthrough on this guy named Matt, another Matt, um, was just like, oh, wow, rejection and this fear of rejection is actually just a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a learning opportunity to get better. So if someone doesn't buy your product. Great. How come? Yeah. And even for me, like I'm doing million dollar week and as I'm promoting it, I'm asking people individually to buy the book. I got that today. Yeah. Why do you think I flew down to Austin and buy the book? Dude, I'll I, I know, but people are like, <laughs> oh, well, and it's shocking because people today are like, oh, is your assistant replying? I'm like, nope, it's me. It's just me. And I, and I think when we think of business, we, we think of it, I, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be, and everyone should be rich. Being rich is great. It buys you happiness. Mm -hmm. Being rich buys you happiness for sure. I agree. I'm so much happier. Yep. Um, I was not as happy poor. And, you know, as I'm doing these things and it's, it's just kind of amazing that people think I'm uh, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna have an assistant or do that. It's like, no, I still keep asking. And the the beauty as you were saying, Matt, it's find the thing you're excited to ask others for. I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm like, yo, I believe I created this and, and you're gonna be great for it. And um, 
James Clear said when I, as I was working on this book, he's like, you can ask everyone, just don't expect anything. And I think that's a nice way of thinking about it where, hey, can I come on your show? Hey, can you come, do you mind coming to Austin? Which you were said about, yeah, okay. And then some people say no and some people say yes. And they say no, you just say, okay, how come? What can I learn from this? Yeah, no, it was a big switch when I was younger, like 21 is like moving, you know, you send a thousand emails at the time I was trying to build out BitMaker, build out the hiring partners there to hire the different students that we graduated and taught them to be engineers. And I kind of just started getting obsessed with the act of just send the emails and just be proud of the act of sending remove the expectation that anyone's going to respond to these. Yeah. And I think sometimes people get too caught up in the expectation that, oh, someone's got to respond or say yes. And that when really trying to just find the reward and like your own effort, your own, just putting yourself out there. Um, yeah. And if you can kind of get a little more obsessed around what you can control versus obviously what you can't, which is whether or not they want to move forward. Um, inevitably That's... you take a thousand swings yeah. like you talk about and like good things are going to happen. They really do just by being in the arena. I mean, two examples of that one, my neighbor, I play football with, we throw footballs across our yard and I was going to write him like, Hey, do you want to come play football today? <laughs> we were like 40 year olds do this. But anyways, I just took my football and went outside and I knocked on his door and I was just like, Oh, this is kind of life, right? This is business. It's like, you can, yeah, I kind of want to be a YouTuber or yeah, I want to have like herb.co or yeah, I want to have founder OS. It's like, I better read more. I'm going to maybe do more. It's like, well, what, what can you do right now? What can you do and take action on this moment to actually move that forward? And so instead of like sending a text and waiting for him, I got my football, went on his door. I'm like, hey, this, you, now? <laughs> and I just realized, it's, it seems like a silly example, but it's a representative of all these actions. Like you want to work with someone, go fly to them. Yeah. Send them like Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. Use Gold Belly and send them like some insane bagel thing or whatever kind of food they're in. Or maybe if they're into weed, send them like a bong. <laughs> I don't really smoke, but you get my point with that. And, then, and the other thing is that I will say, you know, for example, with promoting this book, with Million Dollar Weekend, I'm emailing people manually. I'm just like, hey, mm -hmm. you're in my audience. I know who you are. And I think people think of business as this abstract, like you send emails and you just get rich. It's like, no, I'm individually knowing the people that are buying. And I will say there's days where no one buys the book. Like I email people and they don't buy it. And I'm like, this is a test of whether I really want it or not. Mm -hmm. Do I really want it? And I think that's great for all of us. And then I'm like, okay, these people didn't buy it yet. I'm going to keep asking more people because I believe in what I'm doing. And it's just a test. And, yep. and you decide whether you pass or not. You're the, you're the teacher, the proctor, and the student. Yeah, and it's all that game that you're playing. I've loved, been loving the game on, on YouTube. You've just been blowing up on that side. And yeah. I think just, yeah, asking people all over the country, over the world, all different yeah, walks of life, uh, you know, whether it's billionaires or just knocking on doors, getting on jets. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're learning a lot. Uh, yeah, man. From that experience, you know, I, I was watching the one video where you're, asking the billionaire, one thing you know, you're on his plane. Yeah. And it seemed like one of the big learnings, at least that I took away, kind of random from the video, I wasn't expecting it, uh, was the importance of like stretching. This guy's just yes, like yes, stretching yes. all the time. And I'm just <laughs> thinking in my head, you know, I do have this goal of stretching every day. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You know, these days getting in like a 10, 15 minute session daily. That's impressive. But to think that, you know, out of all this guy's deployed his capital <laughs> to, it's just like the ultimate stretching dude. Like what else have you learned from these folks you find from these kind of like unconventional conversations you're having that you wouldn't have guessed from some of the most successful people out there? Yeah, man. We've interviewed billionaires. There's 3,000 billionaires on the earth. Wow. I thought it was way more. Yeah. It's like pretty small. Yeah. Well, that's what's, that's what's yeah. online. And I've interviewed a few of them. It's pretty amazing. And I've worked with a few of them. You know, Zuckerberg. I've emailed all of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually we are. So we're getting the, you can get the fortune 2,000 and then actually go through them. Wow. Right. So just work yeah. backwards. Most people, and they're trying to get a, a wife or a husband. I'm like, how many people qualify for your husband? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, how many? 20? That's actually not that bad. You could probably find them. You don't need to like go on a, You might go on a dating app, but you also just go on LinkedIn or go on Instagram and like find the ones that fit your criteria. Totally. Yeah. Um, it's been, it's been amazing interviewing and meeting all these kind of people. One thing I want to tell for everyone out there, whether you're doing a service business, whether you're just trying to be a good partner, whether you're building an e-commerce business or a content creation business, you're not seeing all the people who reject me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Literally like Dave Portnoy, I've, I've spent now probably six months trying to get or this guy named Peter Rahal who founded RX Bar. I've spent 18 months trying to get. Or people I know, like Alex Ohanian. I've known him, the founder of Reddit. I've spent probably now two years trying to get. You're seeing like out of all my swings, the one swing that makes it. And I think that's just such an important message out there. For one, be clear on what you want. Like I like making the content. I love entering these people. It's such a, it, it, I, get, I can't believe I get to hang out and learn from them and then share it and then people consume it and we all benefit. But it's also that I want it and so I'm swinging a lot.
I'm yeah. really doing a lot. It's like, and it would be very easy to be discouraged from one rejections on the streets, but two from rejections from uh, like Mark Pincus. I messaged him again today, but I keep following up. Like mm-hmm. I was talking about Million Dollar Weekend. The number one way you get something done is through a follow up. Yeah, and most people never follow up. It's no. unbe- it's and people. And the thing is, everyone knows it. Everyone knows to follow up, but we still don't do it. So just try it once. But the reason we don't follow up is because we don't really want it. And so it's figuring out, okay, what do I really want? And then sticking with those things. So I think that's probably, it's it's not the message I get from them. It's the message I get from me as I go through this experience. Yeah. In terms of meeting them, huge point that I comes back to me time and time again is you can get rich in so many ways. Just to go veterinarian clinics, strawberries, construction, burn building construction, tree equipment. Making equipment to cut down trees. Uh, John Paul DeJoria, hair care. John Paul DeJoria, tequila. Kinkos, printers, copiers. Um, you were mentioning James, energy trading. We've done him and Rafa, or energy trading. The Uggs founder. The Uggs founder, shoes, which he didn't even invent. It was someone else in, in Australia, and right. he brought it to America. That's right. It's, it's just amazing how many different ways people get rich. Yeah. That is just, it's, it's unbelievable in all these different categories. And I think that is so powerful uh, for people to realize. Because if, if you're interested in being behind the camera, Maybe someone like yourself wants to be in front. That's great. Like Jay, uh, this guy I just met, paid him $4,000 just to set up the room, not even for the equipment. Yeah, Jay Stevens did a great job. You can set up equipment. And so it's fascinating to know that. I think the other thing as we talk about Million Dollar Weekend is asking. I just ask these people like, hey, can you come and share your story? And lots say no, but the world will open up and you'll get what you want instead of getting what you get just by asking. Mm -hmm. I I had a parking spot landlord. (laughs) I was paying like 200 a month for this parking spot. And I was like, Hey, can I take you out to lunch at True Foods here in Austin? I'd love to know how you you got this parking spot and like, what'd you do to get rich? He's like, sure, I'll take, you can take him out to lunch. So I took him out to lunch, $20. And he sold a software company and now he build, he buys apartment complexes, uh, upgrades them and rents them and sells them. I've put $300,000 into his uh, investments and it's done pretty well, done pretty well. And that's just because I asked him for lunch. And so the reality for everyone is like, you can get rich a lot of ways. You got to keep swinging. You got to keep asking. And then I'd say last thing that, that, I like is specifically John Paul DeJure. He's just kind. He seems like a very kind, but some of these people don't seem very happy actually. Really? They don't seem like they're good to their families. They don't, they don't seem like they, you know, like they're checked out kind of thing or just, they're just focused on their money. Uh, They're focused on making more. They're mm -hmm. focused on the status. They're focused on getting more attention. And it's, I think the bigger thing about that for myself is the opportunity in life to consume Matt's content, to consume Noah's content, to meet your doctor, Ask your lawyer or ask your, maybe your doctor or banker or accountant, like if they know interesting people. Everyone has someone in there, whether you're in India or South America, you know someone that might know other people that are interesting and just try to consume and see what kind of life you want to live. Hmm. And that's been really powerful to me. See John Paul DeJoria just be, seems like he's super happy. He's like, I find a few products. I promote the shit out of them. I learn, I sell a lot of them. They're all in the reorder business. And I just like to donate back. And I'm like, I like this guy's life. And so you kind of can pick and choose different people's lives to see which ones you want to model. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I remember you know, just before we got on air here, I was talking about how about, I don't know, maybe 13 years ago, I was on AppSumo, bought the copywriting course from, from Neville. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, really transformed my thinking around copywriting. Wish I had stuck with it and gone deeper, but then kind of revisited again five years ago and again sort of changed my life. Um, I'm curious on your side, like obviously with this many ass, this many rejections, you've got some <laughs> like magic copywriting ass. So yeah. say you're trying to get out, you know, you're trying to go, let's just say George Clooney. We're trying to get on his radar. You know, what's your approach to getting in front of someone like that? And I'm just naming some random name yeah. that came to mind. Yeah, we can you know, do you got, you got tacos, you got tequila guy. Uh, how are you getting to him? And then also like, what are you asking and where? And like, what's that script? Yeah. So taking a step back, the law of 100 is something that has helped me where my podcast, noahkagan.com slash podcast, I quit after about 30 episodes. And if I just would have stuck mm. to 100, like it would be a top 10 podcast today. Yep. And every one of us has a story of if we just would have stuck with copywriting, if I just would have stuck with this job, or if I just would have stuck with something, oh man, I'd be so much further today. Like maybe even yeah. as a kid, like stuck with piano or whatever oh, yeah. it is. We all have, we all have a story. I would have been Bach. <laughs> you you could have been. Could have. I mean, you still can. You still can. And I think it's understanding and realizing, okay, let me create a framework, which I believe law of 100, which is doing it a hundred times and then deciding to quit. So getting a hundred guests, trying to send a hundred messages, yep. doing a hundred days, whatever it is, will help you stick with something before you're going to quit. Now let's take, let's take George Clooney. So you want to ask, how do we get a hold of George Clooney? I think a lot of times the, the first thing you have to think about is like, what is in it for this other person? 
Yep. So I always think of whiffed. What's in it for them? So for someone like George Clooney, I don't know what's important to him. Um, I'm guessing, I know he's got the Casa Amigos. Uh, he's probably got some charities. He might have some other things that he cares about. So it'd probably start that. The local government of Lake Como? Lake Como. I think he's selling it. Oh, okay. I don't know if he's, I don't, he's I, don't, I, don't follow, I don't follow enough people <laughs> magazine as much as I used to or like TMZ. But basically I would try to understand like, what is he doing that I can then support? Because you can see publicly what people are doing. Like you're running Founder OS. If I wanted to get a hold of you, I would either go buy Founder OS or I would go support it in some way. Like, hey, I'd refer people or I'd promote it. And then I would hit you up. Mm -hmm. Most people say, hey, Matt, I want to help you. And instead, go bring Matt customers. Go bring Matt what his goals are, and then he'll mo most likely respond. So with George Clooney, I'd probably um, would either buy some Casa Amigos, which I've already done. I've drank it. Um, but figure out something that I could do to support him. I think a cold e email probably wouldn't work. I don't think he checks DMs. He's, he's at a super level yeah, yeah. of status. So the two ways I'd probably approach it is one, at that level, different depends who they are, but at that level of celebrity, you just go to their agent. So they just go to their agent. And most people have public index of who their agents are. And you can just contact their agent. The other way I would look at it is like, who has he acted with that's small? Or who has he interviewed with? It's specifically if it's an interview for a show, I just go see who he's interviewed with. So there's a guy, uh, I think it's his name is David out in New York. And he's interviewed like A-Rod and uh, Tyson. I think his name is uh, David Roberts. And so I just like hit up David. So hit up the people that have already gotten to that person right. and then figure out what they did or see if you can, hey, can I pay you for some advice? And so David and I are now texting because he's interviewed some people I want to connect with. So I think those are probably the, the two most likely. And then I'd say lastly, it's sticking with it. Most people have probably send one letter to the agent, maybe try to do one person and be like, eh, it's hard. Yeah. But I'm like, it's to me, it's almost as we said about rejection, it's a game. I'm like, okay, I'm going to see if I can keep getting rejected because I want to I want to see if I could score here. Like, right. let's see if we can get 10 rejections. And you'd be surprised if you show up at the door, what you can actually get. So like, like you did, you flew to Austin, fly to LA, fly to Lake Como. You have to be balanced not to be creepy. You have to be not be creepy. <laughs> it's a fine but, line. Fine line. But the point is, is like, ask to send something to the agent. Hey, I want to send something. Put together an amazing package. If you know he likes shoes. Like, it is so cheap to meet people. It's unreal. Like, you can literally go, and I've done this. I'll buy, I'll find something like shoes. Or I wanted to be on someone's pot. I've sent shoes before. Benchmade is like these, do you know Benchmade knives? No. Super high quality knives. Like the best knives made in America. There's a guy I wanted to, uh, I wanted to interact with and, and be on his show and so forth. And so I... Instead of just being like, can I come on your show? I was like, I'm going to send you a print out of the book with a handwritten custom note and this knife because I know he's into outdoors and stuff like that. And so for George, you know, maybe it's boots, maybe it's some kind of pants. I know he does motorcycles. So maybe it's some jacket I found on Etsy or got customized. That's like, let's say 500 bucks. Right. It's a joke. It, it's insane. So that, you know, it may not happen right away, but it's sticking with it. Another example is like Dave Portnoy. He's super famous. Uh, I want, really want to get, talk to him. I want to feature him. Come on, Dave. Dave, come on the show. But Dave is like super hard. So you just keep sticking with it though. And so with Dave, it's been, uh, I submitted ad requests to Barstool Sports to do a $20,000 ad sponsorship. That will Because the, the video will make 20K in ad revenue for us. Nice. So I was like, Dave, we'll drop 20K to any charity you want. He's already rich. Like rich people like me don't, like you offer me 5K. No, I wouldn't take it. But if you offer like them like 5K, 20, they're not going to take it. Yeah, yeah. But you donate 20K, they might yeah. take it. And yeah, so you're on their radar. They're at least, they, you're serious. You know, most people, 99% send messages that are like, hey, I'd like to be your video editor. Hey, can I like come work for you? And it's just like, that's why they get deleted. You only have to do it 1% better to stand out. It's very easy. Yeah. Just most people don't because they want, they just don't put in any work. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I feel like too, like most people need to sort of think about those initial outreaches is like, that is your interview. Like front end load. The, like, you know, edit a video of mine or review, uh, like some of the threads we've made or the blog posts or like, just dive in deeper there. Inevitably that's the second conversation or third that you're after at some point. So just front end load that stuff and just provide the value out the gate. Like you're saying, just do that 1% more to stand out from all the rest of the noise. that's going to be clogging folks inboxes and then just cause you to get lost in the sea. A hundred percent. Standing out is so easy. <laughs> it's actually like a joke how easy it is. Yeah. Like. And make a loom video, share something on your desktop that you've learned or review some, like it's, yeah, it's, it's shockingly easy these days. Yeah. I mean, two, two stories of that was Cam, our editor who makes six figures doing editing our, our channel. He just sent me a video. He's like, Hey, I really love the channel, but I'm gonna give you some analysis. Send me like a two minute loom video. That's all it took. Mm -hmm. Six figure job. Nice. And then for me at mint.com, I got rejected. And so I spent literally 40 hours putting together a marketing plan, researching, studying, unpaid. There's no, there's no guarantee it was going to happen, but it was so good. 
I brought it to the CEO and I said, hey, and I didn't really know him. I said, hey, this is what I want to do for you. If you like it, pay me six figures. He's like, okay, I believe it. Like I saw what you've, you've, you're willing to put in the work. And right. most people, most people are like hoping and they're wishing they're not actually starting. And I think that's the, that's in the book now, not how is that mindset of like, let me go do something to make it like a no brainer, un, like unquestionable that I have to respond to this person. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think, yeah, it's either like do it now or, you know, people get too focused on like, you know, the, how to accomplish things. I think that's where they always get tripped up versus just do something now do something yeah. yeah or find someone that can help you with that thing but don't get so lost in the soup of perfectionism when you're just trying to get on someone's radar just get the first iteration of something out kind of done is better than perfect versus just getting lost in it well i have so you've had herb that's done well bitmaker did well this sounds like founder well. how many things have not done well oh man well i mean in each of those there's <laughs> thousands of things that haven't gone well and uh of the main things those have all gone well but uh yeah. I mean, it's more, there's a lot of experiments within those that have failed. So, um, you know, I started herb, it was called the stoner's cookbook. I mean, I remember an that. outrageous name, um, that obviously like didn't have much legs if we were going to try and make it big. Um, we released a cookbook, super random. I don't know why we released a cookbook. That was kind of weird. Uh, you know, oh man, I could go down a host of things. Um, at Bitmaker, we launched different programs there that were failures. Um, and so, yeah, Founder OS actually started as something called Soulful Entrepreneur. Sounds like I'm a cult leader. Um, so, you know. It sounds like you you named one thing and then change and it works out. Yeah, That's yeah like exactly. So I always like, yeah, I always come, come to the show with one name and then that kind of flops a bit, but then we just reorganize it a little bit. Name does, a yeah. Names don't matter. You know, people ask, someone asked me today, uh, what name do you think I should name my company? I'm like, ask your customer. But you're like, yeah, they don't care about your name. They care about the problem you solve. And Again, I think coming back on it, because I think it's such an important point, you've, you've shown it yourself, which is the most successful people have swung the most. They're mm -hmm. actually out swinging. It doesn't mean that everything works. Yeah. Right? It's just like, all right, well, at least I'm going to keep trying. There's and it doesn't have arena. to be big. Yeah, they're in the arena. I love that line. I think it's kind of made fun of. I think it's awesome. Yeah. They're actually out there trying. Totally. And just before we came on air here, we were talking about too, like I was actually talking with a founder uh, just a couple hours ago and you know, he was trying to figure out for his different businesses, you know, at what point does he kind of put these things more on autopilot and bring a general manager on board? So he's kind of out of the soup of it all. You know, there's always this desire as founders to like get the business on autopilot, get ourselves out. We have success stories doing that, failures doing that. Um, I've been able to successfully do that with Herb and, and kind of get myself basically entirely out of the business. Um, I've done that in other businesses early with Bitmaker and did it too soon. And quickly had to come back and rescue it. And it seems like you've had uh, a similar situation with stuff you've done. What do you find is like that right balance of like, okay, you started the thing, it's taking off. But maybe you want to get a level of time freedom and just get out of some of the nitty gritty. Yeah. How do you know like when the right timing is to do that from your perspective? Being a time millionaire is awesome. Being a millionaire is great, but you should be a millionaire and a time millionaire. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's amazing just to be the what's available in life to what you can do. And, and knowing that that's there, that's where everything works backwards from. I believe that everyone needs to understand like, what's the hardest thing they can do in life and do that. What is the hardest thing that they can do and do that? And so for me, coming back to AppSumo was not by choice. It was because Eamon quit Well, I was, I was biking America and he calls me and he's like, Hey, I'm quitting today. And I was like, can you wait till I finish my ride? <laughs> and he said, no, Oh no. <laughs> he actually said he, he would, he has, he has a lot of integrity. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for you to come back from your bike ride. Just bike faster. <laughs> He's like, which was highly motivating. But the fascinating thing about that was that, you know, we all have a hero inside of us. We all have courage. Everyone does. And whether we haven't exercised in a while, it just takes some time to, to get those reps back in and get that, that creator's courage back up. And so for me, I was really afraid of ruining the company. I was afraid of like, okay, it's, I was getting, I was making probably two to 3 million a year while he was working. And so I didn't work for three years. And I was like, wow, I'm so unsatisfied. And it's not a boohoo story. It's still great to make money and not have to work. Mm. But coming back, I'm working more, making less, and I'm, I'm happier than ever. Mm. And so that's the counterintuitive thing because I think people, most people idealize, oh, well, we'll get a company, get it going, hire someone, and let them do it. And I'm kind of the opposite. We're like, this has been great doing it. And I, I thought that having someone else do it like led me to, to be relaxed all day. And it's like, you don't really find that much satisfaction. It's nice to have something to do that you like and work hard. We all are proud of what we work hard on. So that, that's actually the, I'd say the more important thing for me is just find something you're interested that you want to stay with and then work hard on it. Now, in terms of hiring people specifically with Amen uh, or any of these businesses, 
It depends if you're really done with working on that biz. Like I have a vision for AppSumo over the, for the next three years. Like I want us to be the SaaS distribution network. SaaS distribution network. Like I truly believe we can be the monopoly. I don't know it sounds so aggressive, but we could be the destination for if you want to distribute your SaaS product, we're the, we're the only place. Not Twitter, not Product Hunt, not Facebook ads. Like you come to AppSumo.com or one of our properties and we distribute your tools. Nice. That's what we love doing. And I'm like, dude, I can't wait for that. So I don't, and I, I, there's definitely days I want to hire someone else and quit. <laughs> there's definitely days, totally. about three days this year, I'm like, oh, I'm done with these people. I'm done with this business. And then you, you know, you go for a walk, you have a good night's sleep and you come back and you're like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. But I think that was number that for me, number one, I don't have, I have more I want to do. Now when Eamon for that specifically, we were done with AppSumo. We wanted to move on to sumo.com, uh, which we built to $6 million AR business. And then we ruined it. And so we had, we just told Eamon, you need to make $120,000 a month and, and just keep it there. Um, and so it was more, we are ready to move on to our next thing. And so I'd say the important part when you're ready to bring on someone else, and, and you've, it sounds like you've done this too, um, start recruiting early. It took, it took maybe a year to find Eamon. And then it took a year to train him. I think that those are kind of parts that are definitely missing. And so if you're thinking, hey, maybe in a year or two, I, I don't want to be here. Like look who's on your bench. And most people don't. And that's hard because you're busy, so busy with the day to day. Yeah. Uh, and so like at AppSumo, there's a few people now who I'm like, okay, these are the future CEOs. Yeah. And so who's on your bench and then be mindful that it might take six, 12, 18 months to ramp them up. Yeah. No, I think that's one of the deceiving things is oftentimes you think, okay, I got to bring in some like outside horsepower into the mix and that's going to solve everything. And then you start to realize, no, actually it's just best to groom the people that are already inside that number one, already know the ropes and number two, already have the internal trust of the team because they've kind of started from the bottom and are now working their way up, kind of showing others yeah. what's possible. Well, that, I mean, that's the AppSumo culture. So our, one of our hiring methods, we do, we do probably two unique things. One of our values is called test and invest. And it's kind of like our hiring where we almost always hire contractors almost exclusively. Yeah. I do the same. Yeah. And then a few people who are really good and we want full time, make full time. So like now the team growth, we did grow to like, maybe there's 77 full time and then about a hundred, 110 with contractors. But now it is like agency contractor and only a few make it to full time. And then the other part of that is that if you're getting more junior smart people, and then you pair them with an elite advisor, you're basically getting the 10,000 hours for very cheap from them. And then you're hiring someone who's like really hungry that actually is like, man, I, I want to figure this out. I really love what we're doing. And then they grow. They also end up making a shit ton of money, but they grow with the business in a, in a much more organic way. So our head of revenue, Sean started six years ago as our junior salesperson hmm. making like no money. And now he's, you know, running a almost $80 million revenue business. Alona came in as our marketing manager. Now she oversees pretty much the entire company. She's the COO. Wow. And so the, and each of them, so Alona has this woman, uh, I think was working at automatic being the COO as her advisor. Hmm. Sean has, he had the guy from Mind Body Online. Now he has a guy from uh, Outdoorsy. And you help coordinate this and this is kind of like a cultural thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So every single leader gets an advisor. That's awesome. So our CFO has the advisor from MailChimp. I have an advisor from Zapier and Glassdoor for marketing. I also have a, a CEO coach. But the idea is you get these people who are excited to grow with the company, excited, will actually care what we're doing. Like when I came back to AppSumo, I, I try to recruit CEOs and I met all these guys and girls and in, they don't care about AppSumo. Mm. They don't care about what we're doing. They don't care about entrepreneurship. And so yeah, it's a stepping stone in their career. Yeah. And it's like, I want $500,000 and maybe they'd be great. I, I, I think this is just the playbook that's, that's worked well for us. Yeah, no, it's worked for me as well. I feel like too, you know, another thing that we have both in common, not just that way of hiring is a uh, kind of a new way of approaching entrepreneurship, especially these days you've been doing this for some time is like one part is actually the building of the business. But you're basically building this whole media side of things to what you're doing as well. You know, million plus on YouTube, flying yeah. all around, asking people all <laughs> over the world, you know, how they're, what they, yeah. how they've made their money. Um, and I think it's easy for someone to look at again, like where that's gotten to, but forget like the humble beginnings it had. You know, I love in the book, you talk about kind of distribution with your kind of circle of influence. And don't just think that you got to do the Twitter thing because everyone else is or the LinkedIn thing because they are. Like think about just your existing distribution, your innate strengths, the things that you use and start there. You know, you started off with Reddit and that was kind of a big thing and yeah. how you got going, meeting uh, one of the early engineers there and yeah. kind of building it out from there. How do you kind of look at building distribution as a superpower, you know, early on in what you're doing um, and kind of cut through the noise? Because I think we both agree that distribution isn't something that's talked about, 
enough. Oftentimes people just start with the product in a dark room and think that when that's built, it's time. And now yeah. I'm gonna market this thing when I think both of us have kind of flipped that on its head. I think you know, you were blogging while you were at Facebook and kind of building a bit of an audience and community right off the jump before you even knew what the heck you do totally. in the entrepreneurship realm. So curious kind of how you look at that. At the end of the day, most people think they have like a marketing problem. Like how do I market this? And they really have a business problem. Yeah. It, like no one, no, it's like, what problem do you solve that actually anyone cares about? Like if you're tweeting, not, it doesn't even matter, tweeting, your food business, your e-commerce business, your consulting business, your content creation business, whatever it is, e you know, e-commerce again, is it actually something people care about? And I, that ultimately is, it, that's what it all comes down to. If you're like, how do I market this? Like, I'm trust me, no one wants what you're doing. <laughs> like, I can't help you market it. Just no, stop telling people. <laughs> yeah, like there's nothing you can do for that. And what you what you have to understand is what's the problem that I'm solving that people are really excited about? And then the marketing comes into play and it's figuring out, okay, what's the best medium of who the person is that I can help with? And then where is that person? And most people kind of just flail around on all these things or ultimately they really haven't solved a problem that matters. So with AppSumo, it was, man, I did all these different businesses and I always got treated like shit. I did payments. So I did like infrastructure payments and stuff and no one really cared about us. And everyone would just like kind of treat me, you know, poorly. They'd be like, oh, we don't want to work with you. Screw you. And I was like, well, what is it these people really care about? And I was, I was talking about it earlier. What's the line? The line is when times get tough and you have to cut things. Like what's above the line that you're like, I can, this is literally what I was doing at AppSumo yesterday. We have our software bill is 250000 a month. I was like, who can I cut and who can I keep? Who gets to cut? Who gets to keep? And, and how do you create your business that's within this line that it's like, shit, well, I have to. It's a need to have. Yeah, I really need this business. You know, if times are tough, like, you know, I, I buy cookies in my neighborhood and it's like $7 a cookie. And I'm like, my friends, that's a, I'll take a quarter of one. You know, that's, that's all I can afford today. That's, that's an easy cut when times get tough and then they'll have to, to iterate. And so in terms of the distribution, I think I've done really well because I've, I've created things that I really wanted. And I think that's the best way to have a business, which yeah. is create something you're excited about. Truly that you're like, I love it. I watch, I'm probably the number one watcher of my YouTube videos. <laughs> I know it sounds weird and it's not arrogant. I just like the interviews. I like the content. I like That's how awesome. we put it together. I'm proud of it. I'm very proud. I think you should be proud. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah thank you, man. Like, doing an awesome job. And uh, I had a step away. I think earlier I'd probably be more concerned if people like it. And But yeah, well, number one, I'm my customer. And then two, I, you have to make sure other people really want it. You have to make sure other people want it. And then the distribution part is, is fun. I think the distribution parts are the exciting thing. Once you found something that people want, they want your book, they want your tweets, they want your stuff. It's like... All right, what are creative ways that I can go find these people? Like we built Sumo, you know, some examples. We built Sumo.com and we wanted more people to install our email pop-up tool. I was like, well, okay, who are the people that have emails, who have sites that might want emails? Like probably blogs. Okay, well, where's there a lot of blogs? WordPress. Okay, well, how can I get on a lot of WordPress blogs? I can go kiss a bunch of people's ass, which sucks. <laughs> the, hey, can you like feature us on your blog? Or hey, can you tweet about us? And like none of them would respond. And I was like, hmm. What other ways can I get a lot of WordPress sites without having to kiss ass that, that's economical and, and can have some potential scale to get a lot of sites? I noticed that like there's a lot of WordPress plugins. This is like a few years ago. And so I was like, hmm, maybe I can buy these WordPress plugins because they're cheap and they don't have any, they don't really sell a lot. And then through these plugins, I can promote my, my plugin. So I ended up spending maybe like $100,000 and basically got insta like about a million plus installs of other plugins. Wow. And then in all these plugins, we promoted sumo.com. And so that was a way where if you're doing it where everyone else is doing it, you have no advantage. Like competing on Twitter is really hard because you're competing against a lot of people. Like even on YouTube now, like there's, you're competing with a, someone like me who has money, I have people and you could still win. You could definitely win and you yeah. could do it in a lot of niches. So it's not that it's not available, but try to compete where there's less competition. Play in a different playing field where it's your own game. Like for instance, on YouTube content, I can make YouTube content that's like, hey, here's like nine ways not to go broke. Guess who else can make nine ways not to go broke? Everyone. Everyone. Guess who's willing to go stand outside an airport? No one, right? Because it's hard, right? And so thinking just more based on what I'm solving, who this customer is, like, how do I do it in a way that maybe I have more of an advantage or an unfair advantage? Like when most people start businesses, one of the number one problems I see is they do it outside of their zone of influence. Right. They just straight up, like, did you smoke a lot of weed before? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really smoke a lot of weed, so you'd definitely kick my ass <laughs> in smoking weed and like a business around smoking weed, which is great. And when most people start, they're like, well, I'm going to do something that I, I heard from a guru or I saw on a Reddit thread or I read a tweet thread about why short-term rental Airbnbs are easy. It's like, why don't you think about what you get paid in your day job for? Why don't mm -hmm. you think about what you're doing as a hobby? Like you could make a poker vlog, like go film people playing poker. 
Yep. People have poker. You can go make poker cards and create a poker business. Like people have a business selling poker cards. And it's just more being mindful of what you're already getting paid for, what you're already interested in, who you have access to, and, and start businesses in those areas where you have an easy chance of winning versus in these other areas where it's just going to be much more competitive. It's interesting. I think people, you know, it's easy to get caught up in, yeah, what are, what are other people doing following the crowd? And really, it's much more of like an inner game, you know, like just keeping, you mentioned in the book, one of your best friends is just a notepad. You know, I love just Apple Notes, keep a frustration list, just writing down in your daily life, just what are things that are just annoying you and not working or, and it could be the dumbest things. Yeah, dude, I'll tell you one of the best businesses I'm so excited about is Christmas lights. I just paid $500 to these guys to put up Christmas lights, it took two hours. I was like, and then, then they store your Christmas lights. They have ARR, they oh. store it for you and then they bring it back next year. Oh, it's genius. I was like. This is a great business. That's like a great business. the real ARR is these businesses that are like that where showing up sober and on time is your advantage. <laughs> you know, you just show up sober and on time and you can win. And these guys, you know, they have a basic ass website and now they have 500 bucks a year for me. That's a pretty good uh, ARR business. Times that by how many houses in the neighborhoods do holiday lights. So I think it's just more that that's my whole point of competing unfairly. You take tech, you take an advantage where you can go and, and show up properly. That's a pretty easy business. That's universal. Right. And so when you're looking at like that frustration list, say you're someone, you know, you're recording and auditing your life over, say, a month period, you know, keeping track of all these things that yeah. are annoying you, frustrating you, could be the smallest things, could be big things. How would you suggest then people that go and look at those ideas or these frustrations and determine, okay, which of these actually have a million dollar potential? Yeah. What's a million dollar opportunity? So in the book, there's the one minute business model. In the yep. book, there's the market research and, and the book has more of the details around that specifically. I think the the easy way where you're considering when you're doing a million dollar opportunity is your, is it a million dollar market? Is it a million dollars worth of people or money that will be spent for what you're doing? And so let's take this house example. So it's $500 for my house. And this is just Austin. How many houses are in Austin that do holiday lights? I'm not sure. No, I mean, just even get, so how many houses do you think are in Austin? Oh, how many houses in Austin? Yeah. Oh man. Like a thousand, 10,000, hundred, probably a hundred thousand. hundred thousand. hundred thousand. Okay. Let's say a hundred thousand houses, 500 bucks. Could I get like a thousand of them? It's yeah, probably course. doable. Yeah. yeah. So if that's a what, five hundred thousand dollar business. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So could I get two thousand and get a million dollar business? Pretty doable. Yeah. That actually seems pretty doable. I don't. I when people do the one percent of markets, I'm like, ah, I don't really believe that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, It's easy to. It's easy on a spreadsheet. It's hard in real life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but what you want to understand is like, is this something that people will spend a million dollars on? Because you're going to work hard either way. So find the thing that people actually want to spend a million on. For instance. I did a video where I wanted to do home office setups. So when, just to show people if it's a million dollar business and I called, just called neighbors and I called friends that I know work at home and it was really hard to sell it. Hmm. And that's great. Cause then you can find something that isn't hard to sell. And you talk to them, you ask them more questions. You, in the book, we, uh, you know, you find out the conversation, their scripts uh, to go through with them. But coming back on that, like a desk is 500, a chair is 200. How many people are working from home a lot? You can again think like, and there's you know the exact steps in the book, how to make sure this is a million dollar opportunity. So if you spend time on it, you understand that. And then you want to try to do something really quickly to validate if people even want to give you money for that. And I think that's where people, uh, that's why I try to encourage people to do things in the now because yeah. you're like, well, do they want it? I don't know. Let me run another model. Let me go get a trademark. Someone asked me today, should I get a trademark? Get the domain. Let me get the domain. Let me set up my email. Let me, let me get my social media set up. You got to have social media of set course, up. You got to have social media. And I was like, does anyone want it? You can find out that literally in 10 seconds, not 10, maybe 30 seconds. And so let's get that. Make sure you have a million opportunity. Validate really quickly. That's why the book yeah. is called A Weekend. Uh, and then you could scale from there. Yeah. And there's a gigantic difference between someone saying, oh, that's interesting. And someone saying, oh, yeah, here's my credit card. and putting it through. And I think a lot of people make that mistake. It's yeah. like they bring it to some people and they get a bunch of thumbs up from people around them but like, it's not real validation. You know, we need to get people to actually pay for that thing. And I think like we both agree with, it's like, that's then the pressure to actually build it. You kind of need that initial transaction to come through or a few of them. And maybe you don't even have much there yet, but kind of just build the parachute now on a way down. Like when we were building Bitmaker, we had no school, no computers, no instructors yet, but just started selling this idea of building this kind of coding school. And then, you know, sold 30 spots for about 300K and the program started in March and this was December. And so we had three months to get the space, get the computers, put it all together and actually That's deliver awesome. on the promise. Uh, but I think too many people feel like they need to have it all figured out at once. And it's just not the case. You know, you can kind of figure this out as you go. But the problem is everyone knows that, but they don't do it. Right. Cause it's scary. 
right? It's terrifying. It's terrifying because you're like, well, it's easier that they said they like it. And I've done this. I've started a a business. I went to these companies and they actually never paid when I delivered what they asked. Mm -hmm. You know, you want the green thumb, not the thumb. Yeah. (laughs) Not thumbs up, I'll do it. Green thumb is you actually get paid for it. and, And that's the reality. And there's a lot of things we pay in life ahead of time. We pay for flights ahead of time. We pay for hotels ahead of time. We pay for food ahead of time. We pay for experiences ahead of time. Why not your business? Oh, well, no, they need to see it. They just need to know the expectation. And, and that's the reality that you can sell and see if people want it. A great example is, is Shaggy. He read the book and he started an event. He wanted to bring on speakers and see if he could have a, a meetup. The reality is no one bought a ticket. And I was like, awesome. Congrats. You didn't spend a lot of money and time doing that. Now, how come they didn't go? What do they want to go to? Right. How else have you made money? What else can we go and keep learning from this? And each weekend, use the process to get to the thing that can then get you to the business and where you want to be. And so now you've built, you know, these eight multi-million dollar businesses over the last 20 years. You got, you know, AppSumo now, quarter billion dollar business. Yeah. How do you think about like quadrupling that and getting it to a billion? Like, yeah. what does that process now look like now that we're, you know, million dollar weekends? Yeah. We've done those, been there, done that. Now billion we're talking. Dollar month. Yeah, billion dollar <laughs> month. Bill, uh, you know, billion dollar decade. And that's actually interesting. If you look at the average time to become a billionaire, it's over a decade. Yeah. Right. And and I think it's about within a decade, you can become a millionaire cash, not imaginary money or uh, real estate million. My goal is not to make a billion dollar business. I have zero interest in that. I'm already rich enough. Mm-hmm. Not in a bad way. I'm just like, I've got, this is cool. Like I have a Miata, I have a Tesla, I have a, a scooter. I can live in Spain and America comfortably. And like now I can take care of my, my girlfriend and our family and donate to others. Like I, I think what people need to understand for themselves is like, what do you wake up excited about? And I, I, it's never been a billion. I've never cared. Like it's to me, that's arbitrary. I'm enjoying what we get to do. I'm enjoying, like I told you before this, uh, chat, I was doing executive compensation analysis. What the fuck is that? <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's incentives, right? It's thinking about, okay, what are the problems I'm having with this person this year that I can adjust their incentives and their compensation so that they'll do more things that I think are beneficial for the business and we'll have less, uh, conflict. That's super cool. And I think with AppSumo, not, I think with AppSumo specifically, it's, our revenue growth, we're going to try to grow 5% next year. Hmm. I'm not as motivated or I don't wake up thinking, how do we get to a million dollars or a billion dollars or even go public? It's not, I do want our team to get rich. I'd like people who have put in the work to get the rewards. I would like to promote more products. I would like to have more customers get our tools, use these tools and be like, damn, I got great deals at AppSumo.com. And so I just think there's ways of how do we promote more that I get more excited about. There's not, uh, there is a net revenue goal. I think our net revenue goal maybe in a few years, maybe a hundred million net revenue, not gross. Gross is way higher. But that, again, that doesn't really get me out of bed. It's just more of a directional singular goal we're moving towards, uh, but not my motivator. Yeah. I oftentimes tell people it's like, I mean, for me, at least what dictates my happiness the most, like am I selling something that people love first off, right? Like, how do you know they love it? I mean, they keep coming back. They tell their friends. Um, I think the other aspect is like, am I enjoying it? Like, and am I, do I love what I do? You know, you can be selling something that people love, but if you hate it, you're likely to be miserable. Uh, and then are you surrounded by amazing people? And yeah. eventually you just kind of like get in the game of that. And yeah, it's less about the money. The money's just kind of a byproduct of all of it. It's kind of a score on the scoreboard. It's less the reason that you're doing the thing. Well, it's, what happens in all of our lives is we have like a, we're angry at someone or we're depressed about something and eventually it's over. Eventually you're not depressed about that. And you're like, well, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. And you have to find a new thing. And so I was really mad at Facebook for firing me. I, I was for probably like 10, 15 years. I was like, I've got to fucking get rich to fuck these guys over and show I'm worthy to myself and to them. And eventually that kind of over time and patience really heals most things and yep. lots of therapy. And eventually then you're like, okay, well, what am I really doing this for? And I love promoting. I just, I love promoting. I love making content and figuring out how do we make a video or how do we make a product or how do we make this thing? And who's the person I need to get it and how do I get them to find out about it? And I would say with AppSumo now, I'm really excited about the new ways we can promote products. There's just new ways we're going to get help promote earlier products and later stage uh, products for solopreneurs. Oh, cool. That's just right now we only promote products if they'll do a deal. So there's products before that are just getting started that need help and products after. And then super cliche, but there's a lot of truth in cliches. And I love I love working with impressive people because I, I think I'm impressive at finding the impressive people. And I just get to work with these people. I'm like... That was really, I really like what you did there. And I'm, and I get to be around it. And, you know, I think I felt self-conscious and second guess myself after Facebook where I'm like, oh, I can't be a CEO. Um, I'll never be able to be as good as these Harvard fucking punks. And 
you know, I'm, I'm great in my own way and we all are. And that was, that's been nice to actually be around other people and be like, okay, I can find good talent. I can do these things. And it takes time for all of us to do action, to keep building up our confidence around that. Mm -hmm. It seems like the similar approach you've taken on the business side of like scratching your own itch and, and having fun and just playing the game is obviously the same approach you've taken on the YouTube side of things, right? Like kind of just playing the game, reaching out to people. You'd be doing this anyways. It's almost the camera to some extent capturing it, maybe in a more extreme standpoint to some extent. But you've been doing this like thousand rejection game well before you started the YouTube uh, The rejection stuff. goals have helped. I think it's very important to think about sustainability. Like yeah. one, it's interesting because it, it's I not zero agree. one. It doesn't get talked about enough. And then no, people go everyone, way too hard in the paint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's easy and, and I've done it. Like like I can go insanely hard. I have a lot of force. Yeah. That's how I, that's my story in my head. I'm like, you have, you're a fucking go. You're a rhino. And lately I, I try to be a little bit of a squirrel. I love squirrels, <laughs> you know, and the squirrels are just playing and they're, they're going to their destinations, but they're not taking it so seriously. And where I'm, I'm, you know, as much as now, the now is important, it's, it's now for a very long period of time. And I found with the YouTube videos that I got very fixated on like how many views and how many subs and what happens if you do that, then you're probably not going to stick with it. Cause if no one watches and you're frustrated, you're going to give up. Mm -hmm. And that's why people quit too soon. Yeah. And so for me with the content, it's what videos or what interviews am I going to do if no one watches? That's great. And that that's been helpful. Cause there's definitely, there's some that are hard that I'm proud of afterwards. And I'll do those like asking, knocking on doors. Like it sucks every time. And I have anxiety for like a month before that video. I don't know. Maybe others don't because they're fake. But if you go and knock on strangers' doors and get rejected a lot, it's yeah. very intense. <laughs> or it can be. And, you know, you make the, the rejection goals and it makes it more fun. And so I, I, I do aim, again, a 10 years longevity, 10 years of content, which is like things I actually want to make content about and things that I think will be interesting uh, for the audience who want to watch. Like, for instance, we were just having a – we basically like a TV show. So we have like a 1,000 ideas and we pick two. So that's how most wow. TV shows are. They like you, – you fight to see what content's really best. And so one of the ideas was nine ways not to go broke and how to make a million dollars. And that's just so fucking cliche. That's even, that's an annoying cliche. That's an annoying YouTube video to me. And I, I'm just like not inspired to make that for myself or for anyone else. But then we were talking more about it and it's like, okay, what other things are there? And it's like, well, what things have you learned from these billionaires and millionaires in detail that we can teach others? Okay, that's interesting and no one else can make it. And, or there's a video I'm really fascinated about, which is like, um, founder versus employee discussion. Hmm. I'm really curious about that. Like, so someone that works at AppSumo that makes, you know, let's say 50,000 and they know I'm making seven figures, right? Like even at me saying, you see how I like cringed up a little bit? Cause I feel, feel a little bad. I want to just have that conversation. And then for others out there that are like maybe landlord versus renter. Mm -hmm. I think there's something interesting about a unique conversation with different levels we have in society and maybe both can learn from each other. That to me is exciting. I think, and when you come back on what we originally were saying, my content's for underdogs. My content is for people getting started on their business journeys. I don't do balloons in houses. I don't give away Lambos. I don't do stupid contests. It's just, I like that. No, I don't really even care for that content. It's just not for me and it's not for the audience I'm making the content for. Yeah, and I think that sustainability side of things isn't talked about enough. You know, see too many people starting, they go hard out the gate. They just start releasing on some insane <laughs> schedule that they can't keep up with. And then yeah. one thing leads to another and there are 50 episodes in or 30 tweets in or there are 40 emails in and and they give up and it's interesting if you can just commit to a number like oftentimes when i try to start something new i'm just like all right i'm going to put in 200 reps of this thing and that's, that's right. the goal not the views not the followers not the money from it just the practice of 200 of these yeah. in a row and just see where that goes and it's got to do something you know at some point something's going to hit but regardless of whether it does or doesn't there'll be a good process and just enjoy it and i think it's tricky sometimes to have to kind of slow yourself down, especially when you got that rhino attitude and you're just trying to, you know, <laughs> quell into being a squirrel. But uh, it's, yeah, it definitely, it's interesting. I find when I kind of take that approach, everything actually just does seem to grow faster. And I think it's not necessarily because it actually does grow faster, but the passage of time seems to go faster for me because I'm actually enjoying the process versus it feeling like such a chore and you're like dreading the thing each time or you're not at the goal you thought so you're miserable with yourself because you're so stuck on the outcome yeah and if you're just having a good time like christmas every year just flies <laughs> by you know does it and it, i think so. i'm jewish dude we have like oh, jews okay. are so lonely in christmas like oh, okay. it's the worst <laughs> the whole month of december i could skip that example no no example. I'm, I'm kidding i'm happy for people to enjoy christmas i just like jewish people are like oh what are you doing all day oh you vey chinese food again you know like <laughs> like it's uh no. it, what stuff for you have you noticed working for you in terms of content creation and, and putting yourself out there so one thing that's worked and one thing that didn't so one thing that's worked for me on the email side just 
setting the goal of I'm going to do 100 email newsletters and just sticking to that, not caring about the subs and just doing that has been just a fun act of just writing. And along the way, enjoyed storytelling, building systems for founders. And that kind of compounded into Founder OS was people kind of asking for more of the systems that I was sharing there. I was sharing a bunch of stuff though. Um, and ended up kind of tripling down on like, okay, I enjoy this a lot. I'm enjoying the act of kind of helping founders with proven systems around some of the things they struggle with. And I'm going to double down in that area. One thing that didn't work is taking a similar approach to what I had on Twitter and LinkedIn as I started kind of growing things of just, you know, publishing your thoughts daily and just putting things out there to the world. When you try that in the YouTube side of things, you quickly realize like, okay, actually the quality bar in this arena is a lot different. So it kind of forced me to slow down and pick ideas that actually get you stoked, kind of take that packaging of first approach, right? Like title thumbnails, looking at a storyboard of a hundred or so of them and picking the ones that really catch your eye and stand out. You learn through action. You don't learn from sitting on the sidelines and strategizing for ages. You know, you just learn from the doing of it and, and good things happen. You can't learn not being in the kitchen. You yeah. can't learn to cook if you're just sitting, like watching videos. You got to be in the kitchen. And you talk too about, uh, I think we've both seen it. Like for me, newsletters across all my businesses are always just the, the beast. And I think too many people think about their product and they think, okay, I need to grow an audience. And they just lose <laughs> the middle part, which is, the emails, the newsletters, and the fact that that's the real profit maker, you know, it's changed the game for the businesses that you've built as well. I mean, yeah. that's how I originally discovered you was the epic emails you guys were writing and yeah. still write. Um, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty epic. Pretty epic, yeah. Uh, you know, how do you kind of think about, you know, what are some of like the different hacks that you guys have inside of your emails now, like beyond broadcast emails, beyond just like welcome series and abandoned cart? Are there yeah. other sort of like, tricks up your sleeve that you can share no i don't want to share them it costs money buy the course <laughs> you know, why would i give it away for free okay <laughs> no. it's like yeah let me just tell all my competitors exactly how we do all of our emails okay no um i, I think th there are things and i can share some of them <laughs> uh, i'm just teasing so there's different let's just say there's like two types of email systems there's like content creator newsletter like course selling email systems and then there's like e-commerce mm -hmm. and there's probably ways you can learn from both of them just to give a few different things that I find interesting or that seem to be working. So on my personal newsletter stuff, I don't know if I was talking to you about it, but one of the things that works well on personal newsletters is doing surveys and I call it survey to sale. And so the way to survey to sale is basically how are you interacting in a way that people can raise their hand about what they want and then you give them what they want and they give you money. Mm -hmm. That crushes. So yeah. what I mean by that is if you're interested in selling a book, if you're interested in selling a course, if you're interested in selling a software, do a survey and be like, hey, what kind of things are you looking for? And then just the people who said they raised their hand permission that are interested, you just manually follow up with them. And, and that, that is unbelievably effective. Um, for instance, we're, for the book, we did a survey asking where should I uh, do my speaking tour for the book? And basically people who said that they were interested in having me do a speaking tour, I followed up with them personally and said, hey, do you want to buy the book? Because you're interested in me doing the speaking tour. If you bought the book, I'll potentially be in your area. And they're like, sure. Nice. Not everyone, but I think it was maybe about a 40% rate. Uh, other speaking things that are really interesting, uh, email things are interesting in AppSumo and as well for this book, it, it's basically like, it almost is a fact at this point and that almost a lot of our sales come in follow-ups. So if you're, if you're trying to sell something, it's probably going to be your second or third email that actually closes it. Yeah. What most people do is they send one email and they're like, sounds good, but AppSumo for Black Friday, we have a morning one, Black Friday's here. And then we have like a 12 hour, depending on the sale, 12 hour, six hour. So uh, reminder, nice. but most people do one. Yeah. And then they maybe do one at the end. And it's just kind of interesting how often people need to see something before they buy. Yeah, it's like uh, that thing like, you know, you open an offer to close an offer, you know, like you open up a deal yeah. to say, okay, this yeah. thing's like closing now, but most people just open up a sale and then it's, that's it, you know? Yeah. Versus saying, okay, it's got an hour left, <laughs> buy it. And you'll see just a massive influx. Yeah. I mean, that that's probably a really interesting one. Specifically, AppSumo is big on FOMO and big on timer. So one of the things that, that you were saying, Matt, and I think this applies for, for everyone is like, what's the urgency? Mm -hmm. right what's the urgency to take action and most times it's like here's the thing go do something mm -hmm. why should they do something right now yeah. so how do you encourage them so with AppSumo I mean our whole site is based on the the products go away and so you have a very limited time to make a decision and that encourages you to either buy or not buy yeah and so how do you build that into your to your own emails uh other things with that with AppSumo on e-commerce specifically um we we do a the amount of testing within emails is probably I don't know maybe a few a week. And then you times that by this is a $40 million unit, right? Like that, you know, a 1%, 5% compound on that is huge. I think people wow. test probably too small. 
Like most people should probably just focus on growing their newsletter, number one, and number two, sending a newsletter every week. Most people aren't consistent with their send, right? They're just like, oh, I'll send it this week. No, it's like, I've literally sent an e-newsletter every single week, maybe for about 15 years. Consistency. Yeah, every single week. I mean, it's great. I have help. So there's this woman named Sylvie who's amazing. And I had someone, Nikki, before, and I do it sometimes, but it's like I have, now I have an assistant who can help me with that, and she's amazing. Um, but at AppSumo specifically, the amount of testing that happens within every email is crazy. So do we send it at 4 p.m. or 9 p.m. on a Sunday? Small one. Do we have the timer at the top of the email or at the middle email? Do we change the text from get it now to uh, go buy the product? So there's just the colors. Yeah. I mean, literally the variations in like 1% for us is like $400,000. Yeah. And when then that compounds. Double, yeah. When you just keep on doing And so every week, it's really Chris. So Chris Grillon, he runs our whole email marketing program. He just kind of keeps, I don't even tell him. He just has, so the important part though, maybe is he has a revenue goal. And another person, Dean has a email signup goal with a revenue per email, you know, which is a, a counterbalancing quality metric. So Chris needs to make revenue, but Dean needs to make sure this many emails and they all need to be, the customers need to spend this much money to make sure that they're not just getting a bunch of emails that don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so Chris, cause he has his goal. He basically just kind of like cycles through a lot of different experiments. Like one experiment this week was, uh, optimizing our redemption email. So can we get people to not even revenue related, but get people to activate the products they buy on AppSumo higher. Hmm. And this is probably the most important part with, you know, with, with AppSumo is that about one in eight or one in 10 of our tests work. But so the, the point of knowing that only one in eight of your tests work is that you have to do at least eight to 10 to get one thing to work. And ideally that one thing could be pretty significant. If not, even if it's 1%, that's for this year and for every year beyond it. And so giving the, whoever's running your program, just the encouragement to be like, would you fail that this week? Yeah. What test didn't work this week? And uh, some of the tests, you know, like some of the timing ones can be huge. Some of shorter versus super long and seeing where that impact is. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, you can start a business and at first, yeah, you get okay with rejection. You're getting that all the time and then something works and then that thing starts working. And sometimes you get too precious about it, just needing to stay so pristine and you got to kind of keep that experimentation mentality all the way through right and keep on allowing yourself you had to fail nine times out of ten with the different tests you're running with that product to kind of find those few gems that over a 40 million dollar a year business like make a massive massive impact that was a 40 million revenue unit so that's just right. email just no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. no no it's okay i just want to give chris his credit for, for that again sometimes people want it to be so complicated and the the best thing that works in business is the thing that works so whatever's working, just do that. And, yeah. and people know that, but they don't do it. Totally. So so for me lately, uh, specifically for a million dollar weekend, as I'm marketing it, the thing that I think others can copy is just I manually email people. People are like, oh, are you doing ads to a tweet, to a thing? No, I just manually email. Let me give you an example. I found out that I wanted to have, my goal for this book is to have a thousand reviews. Because I can control literally having, I literally have, I'm not joking. I have a list of a thousand people with names. And I'm just going to check them off if they left the review, an honest review. They can say it sucked. I think the book's really good. But if they said it sucked, that's okay. But at least they left the review that they, they said they would. So my only goal is to get a 1,000 to do it. I think that that'll then, you know, have a lot of other dividends. And so on Twitter today even, I just posted and this again. I did this two months ago at work, so I'm doing it again now, and I'm going to do it again next month. I said, hey, DM me or leave a comment if you're interested in being on my launch team. And then I manually, me and Tommy, go through each person that said yes, and we just message them and say, hey, to join our launch team, do you mind buying the book? So the the thing there that I, I think matters, one, do it in the medium. Like if people are on Twitter, don't tell them to email you or go to your website, DM them. Or if they're emailing, stay in the email, wherever it is. Secondly, how do you do more manual? Yeah. Way more manual, like one by one. I think people get so focused on a million in scale, they forget that just go back to getting serving one customer and one viewer and one person. Yeah, those 100 true friends. Like, it really, I mean... This book, most of the people who are on my launch team, which is, I think it's about a thousand, two, three people, we're, we're, and we're closing it in the next month. I know most of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know most of them, which is crazy. People think, oh, you have these audiences and you kind of disconnect. It's like, I think it's cool that I get to understand who these people are and I see their names and they know I'll reply to them. And so when you were conceptualizing the book, I'm actually writing one right now. And nice. just, you know, and, but it's like, it's such a non linear process. You know, you're, you're brainstorming a bit. You come back to the drawing board, at least for me. Like I thought it'd be a straight shot at a concept, but it's tricky. I'm curious, like how did you conceptualize it all? How'd you know, like, was it like, I want to write this million dollar weekend thing or was it, you know, were there 10 ideas and maybe million dollar weekend was just a chapter in a larger book, but then you kind of narrowed in like, okay, no, this yeah. is the money right here. Let's, yeah. let's stick with this part. So two pieces there. 
one 15 years ago i was bicycling in new york with my buddy adam gilbert from mybodytutor.com and we're in new york and it's cold and we're biking around and i just remember telling him like one day I, my dream is to have a book and i don't believe then and now there's ever been a book that can really help people get a business going that have limited time and no money there's just nothing i've never seen anything otherwise i didn't need to write the book i would let someone else do it mm -hmm. and i just remember telling him that and i was just like ah it just never went away and the, subsequently i had an article on tim ferris go viral which was how to build a million dollar business in a weekend hmm. and that article that went viral took me six months to write i spent six months writing it and then it went viral and it was it was like oh that's interesting like there's something there with that and then the actual process of writing it was really funny. So I finally said, hey, AppSumo is getting to a place where I, it's getting stable. I feel like I've had, I've started so many businesses, which no one else has, that has done well time and time again. I've helped a lot of people. So I feel like I'm at a point where I, I don't think there's anybody else really on the planet who's done where, what I've done for myself that I feel confident to write this book. And so I wrote a draft called The Challenge and I hit up Ramit Sethi's agent, Lisa Demona, so Lisa, I got this book, it's called The Challenge. I wrote up a book, a proposal, can you take a look? And she took a look and she laughed at me and she said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, this is not serious, you're not serious. I'm like, what do you mean I'm not serious? You're like, this is not what a proposal even looks like. Do you know what it looks like, a real one? I'm like, no, I just thought you like put some shit in a page and and I think there's a, a powerful lesson about you know an amateur versus professional, mm -hmm. minor leagues versus major leagues like millionaire versus thousandaire. And it's the difference of like the quality of what you're actually doing and the expectations you have are gonna be proportional to the work you do. And so I went back for a year to write a book proposal and I hired, and this is one of the things with the book and, a, and I think an advantage, same as I hire experts at AppSumo, I found an expert in proposal writing. So this guy, David Maldoir, and I went in with my original proposal and he was like, yeah, this is trash. There's no one who would ever get this book. And I wanted to be a, a, a published book with a traditional publishing house because the best books in the history in the past hundred years have all been traditionally published. And I want it to be a book that stands time. So we spent a year writing it and he's like, challenge is stupid shit. We're not doing that. And then he wrote James Clear's proposal, which has done pretty well. Yep. And so we collaborated on getting the proposal together, spent one year writing it, went out and then wow. we're one year for the proposal, just the proposal. Wow. And a lot of that is taking the, the original article, which worked. So have some validation, trying a lot of tweets out, which James talks about. Uh, the amount of science that the amount of scientific testing I would say that went into the actual book was more than I expected even hmm. to see what people actually resonate, what messages resonate, like the now, not how. I mean, some of this stuff, um, just unbelievable because we survey people. We have uh, everybody who re gets to do the book and go through it on weekends. We do five person cohorts every weekend. Oh, yeah, we can talk about that. So anyways, coming back urgently, year to write the proposal, paid him a lot of money, went to Lisa and she's like, okay, I'll take you on now. And I was like, oh man, wow. And again, it's like, do you want it? Getting what you want is easy, but you have to put in the work and you have to know what you want. Then I was like, well, I want to write the book with the best business writer in the world. And some people are, are so stupid, frankly. They're like, I, I want to write a book myself and be proud of it. It's like, well, do you want to go to do surgery on yourself? Are you the best doctor? No. What are you the best at? And I, this is an, an age thing is that in your 20s, you think you can do it all, which is great. And as you get older in your 30s, you realize like, well, what am I great at? Let me do that and really hire people who are great in these other areas that like it. And so... I said, well, why don't I hire the best writer in the world that I can and pay as much as I can, which I paid a lot, to find a writer who can collaborate with me on this book, who's a, an excellent writer. I'm a blogger. I'm a content creator. I'm not a writer in stories. And so Tal Roz from Never Eat Alone and Never Split the Difference, he wrote two of the top 10 business selling books in the past 10 years. I, I, was, I cold emailed him and I was like, can we talk on the phone? I'd love to, I, have, I, got, I think I can get a lot of money from a publisher and let's write a book together. And I basically cold emailed him. I, he, I closed him, went to the publisher. I, I closed Penguin, which is the number one publisher in the world. Got paid a lot of money. And then I spent all that money on Tall and getting the book ready. And then actually writing the book with Tall took about two years. Wow. And so the languaging of the book is really interesting. Like, you know, like now, not how, right? And yeah. I'm curious how that whole process goes. Because I feel like that's something that gets really <sighs> overlooked, you know? And when you look at yeah. books like, you know, James Clear's and, and others, it's interesting, first off, how a lot of these amazing books started as a blog post or a much smaller piece of content, you know? Um, it's all Mark about Manson's validations. And, you know, uh, James Clear's, Mark Manson's. Tim Ferriss. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Ramit's stuff has had a blog. I, th I think the idea is how do you, you know, this is just literally what I teach in the book is yeah, how are you validate? content. Yeah, how do you validate what you're doing Yeah, and valuable content that you know that people are going to resonate with it? So within our book, we spent two years 
condensing everything I've ever written this blog post, running AppSumo.com, stories, putting it together. And I would say what was the most fascinating about it was taking the book. There's, there's probably two sections, but taking the book and then we had 20 people per chapter review the chapter. Whew. Per chapter. Wow. And separate people. Different so, people each time. Yeah, every chapter like was... focus a, group per chapter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so every chapter got scrutinized and it was disappointing how bad the book was <laughs> because you write this book and you're just like, dude, this is great. And it's then your you, baby. Yeah. And you know, you get, so you're in the fishbowl. It's hard to know you're a fish when you're inside the bowl. Yeah. And so they're like, I don't know what this word means. This doesn't inspire me. And really what I was looking for, what's the things that they're like commenting on, like, like this, like this. And I more or less deleted everything else or when they were uncertain, but they liked it, explain it better. You know, most people learn through stories and through frameworks. And so how do you create an easy linear framework and stories that get people excited to actually complete it? And, you know, we did this, this beta group and that was rough. That was, that was really rough. And so the overall process, uh, and even the cover, right? So the cover, similar to James, James tried 400 covers to get to the, yeah. I, I think people, this is probably one of the most interesting things in, in professional life, which is like the things that are really impressive and work people just think are actually really easy and lucky. Mm-hmm. But the like, magic is that it looks easy at the end, but no, there's really like the reps have gone in. It, it's, I've swung a lot. You know, this book is after I've, I've already created content for so many years and started all these businesses and all these things. And um, this cover, I think we probably did about a hundred testing, right? So the same cover in six different colors, same color, same cover with different subtitles. And then you'll see if you actually, once you read the book, now that you've read it, if you go back on my Twitter over the past two years, you'll see me tweeting mm. things <laughs> and seeing which ones get a lot of comments on. And then you'll be like, oh, wow, that's in the book too. But a lot of ones that aren't are cut out of the book. And then um, and then today, fast forward to today, we had people every weekend, still every single weekend now, five people get the book, the actual book, and I coach them throughout it. And I notice what they where they're getting stuck, where they're really excited. And then we've been able to make revisions on the content from that. And at the end of their weekend, they fill out a form. And that form is like, where were you? Where'd you finish? What stood out to you? What was boring? Or where'd you get stuck? And that helps us kind of re- rejigger the content. So really what I'm saying at the end of the day, it's how do I stack the deck as much as possible that yeah. if, if you were looking to have a book that changes your life in a weekend, uh, the probability that we can do it is high in this book. Because what I've been thinking about is like writing a book easy, writing a great book hard, getting a book that people actually read and take action on like near impossible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, reading a tweet and hitting the like button, that's that's trivial. Yeah. So Interesting. So yeah, you put a lot of testing into yeah each chapter. The cover has hundreds of tests. 20, you know, focus groups of 20 people. For Mocking each it up. And so we mocked it up in Amazon. We mocked it up in like the Amazon listings, right. mocked it up in bookstores. And well, so you can see there's a reason it's green. Almost like YouTube thumbnails being tested on a homepage or something. Our recent YouTube video that's coming out, probably this time this comes out, this is coming out in third, yeah. it's the 100 photos. We'll take 100 photos for a thumbnail, custom uh, photos. We'll hire a photographer just to take the photos. And then yesterday the team is just debating the drop shadow in the thumbnail. <laughs> I'm like, great. There we go. That's great. what you want to see. Uh, and so those are those moments you got to pinch yourself. You're like, now I found the right people. These are great. Yeah, they care. They're hungry. They're, you know, there's a 23 year old guy who I found, Jeremy found him. He has a, a Catan channel. He plays a lot of Catan. And, uh, but yeah, same with the book. It was, you know, it's a balance. You can't A B test your way to success. A lot of people, are, I'm just going to test these things. It's like, no, you have to have an opinion. Mm-hmm. But certain things, you know, with the book, for instance, we were doing uh, beta testing the book. And there's a guy, Felipe, who's a developer and he wants to have his own business. And so I noticed he's like not committing a little bit. So I was like, all right, I'm going to add a section in the book where he has to write a contract to himself. I love that part. <laughs> that, that was genius. I actually sent that to someone on my team. I'm like, this is smart. <laughs> That's also a copy from Artist Way. So the Artist Way, you have to do a contract. But I have Felipe do it. And he's like, I'm like, Felipe, what's hesitating here? And he's like, well, I'm not saying this. So I use his words and I put them in the book. Hmm. And so a lot of it is just listening to who your customer is or the the back of the book, I sent it to the my customers, the readers, the launch team. I said, here's what our back of the book is looking like. And they're like, trash, trash, trash. That's kind of interesting. Move that to the top, cut everything else, and re revitalize it based on who who's my ideal customer. I, I think we think we're always the best knowing of things, and the reality is we're not. Mm-hmm. And so getting the actual results, seeing if people say yes or no, seeing if, what they'll actually comment on, uh, you can make improvements on. And from all these tests, all these focus groups, all these reps, like, is there something that stands out as like that biggest epiphany moment that's helped these people? Because I can imagine, you know, you hear about courses online, like it's something like only 
you know, 10% people actually complete. And that's with like an instructor and a little bit yeah. more handholding, you know, a book is probably even a 10th of that, you know, yeah. just given the fact that there's no accountability, they got to actually do it themselves. <laughs> and then they got to actually apply the stuff that's in the book. Yeah. And so, you know, what's that sort of epiphany you think people are getting that is causing them to actually take action and implement the stuff? What's the last book you that changed your life? I mean, it's interesting that you bring it up. I don't know if it's meant to be or maybe it's just probably the recency effect, but artist way, I was uh, drinking and smoking way too much weed oh. and then sobered up and then was told by a sober mentor of 40 years, read the artist way and go through that. And so I read the book and every week would complete the, would go through the different exercises and nice. journal every single day. And it helped me get sober, quit alcohol, quit weed four or five years ago. Still and, sober? Uh, yeah. Nice. And, uh, and yeah, so I mean, that book was pretty transformative in that moment for me. Yeah. And it was something that I think due to the fact that mentor had recommended at a time of need of that, you know, I needed to kind of clean myself up. Um, it was really useful. So that was one. But I mean, there's a, yeah, there's probably like a dozen of the very few, 200 though. books I've read. Very few. There's very few that actually, you know, in a, a month later really impact your life and it actually sustains. And that's interesting. Right? You know, there's something interesting about that. And maybe that's good. So people shouldn't write books or better that hey if you're on a book you have to really be something what's unique about what you're yeah, teaching commit. yeah you know some of the books uh, i was discussing one that I, that I thought you know artist way is definitely life-changing i used to think i'm not a creative person i mm. thought i'm a business person mm. i make money that's my skill and i always used to joke when the aliens come down i'm like well i can sell you some things i can help <laughs> you do your marketing but where, where, let me position your your alienship so you're gonna you're gonna take our lobotomies you're gonna take our brains out i got you let me do the marketing and i was like man i got no skills there i've got no and then that book really unlocked that I can be creative. I can take photos and they're actually good. Or I can be creative on just doing camera stuff. Or And I felt empowering. And the amount of books that are like that is very small. And yeah. so in our book, in Million Dollar Weekend, it was noticing what changed people's lives. It's really about what we did is we tried a lot of things out in an order. Like here's the order. Noticing where they're skipping. Noticing where they're like, no, nah, it doesn't matter. Noticing where we're trending. I think a lot of people create like fake names on things like here's our donkey framework. Here's my this thing. And it's like, what's the one they're actually still doing later? And the shocking one, this is the one I didn't expect. Um, it's the now, not how. Mm -hmm. Number one by far. Hmm. And we surveyed. I mean, this is literally after every reader, after every read, they do the survey and this is the number one thing. And what I think is powerful about that is most people want to be rich. Everyone wants to be rich. Let me be clear. Everyone wants to be rich. Everyone wants to be more focused. Everyone wants to be more healthy. And then why is there always this like, that's why Atomic Habits is the number one bestseller in the past few years. Because everyone wants those things. But then what's really holding them back from that? Yeah. What's really holding them back? Yeah, it's not taking action. They're not doing shit. Yeah. Because it's easy. It's nice to have a beer, which I'm going to do later. You know, it's nice to sit on our asses. It's nice to consume tweets. It's hard to make a tweet. It's hard yeah. to make, you know, a book. And so the reality for all these people who have the ability, there's so many basic ass people I meet. I'm like, you could be richer than I am. You could have whatever you want. If you wanted it, it's, it's available. You just have to want it. And once they just start doing these things, they're like, holy shit. Yeah, I can do that. And that that has been a transformation, like a 180. Uh, Rico Glover, who I mentioned, just started doing more things, asking, does it mean he's going to make a million dollars this weekend? No. Does it mean he's going to make it in some weekend? Yes. Uh, Rico Glover, this guy named Oliver, the guy named Pat I mentioned to you, this girl named Megan who started selling courses, on, I think, on cybersecurity. She's like, holy shit, it's working. And so they're just getting in this mindset of, okay, let me just keep staying in the reading, keep experimenting. Most successful people like yourself, me, a lot of people I know, all they've done is they just kept going. They started and they just keep starting and they start and they start and they start. Yeah. No, I think it's a great motto for people getting going in now, not how. And I, I remember uh, the book, Who Not How. I yeah. Of my thinking a lot too. <laughs> I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, there's all these damn things that I'm just trying it's, to do myself as I'm building this business and I need to get... Yeah get some help here. Um, yeah. So it feels somewhat reminiscent of that, at least for me, but more for like the, the beginner. And I mean, but then again, for all of us too, yeah. all of us procrastinate. I think that that's partly why these sorts of things, whether it's James Clear or that part of your book resonate so much too, because it just comes up so many times in your day. And so if you can go and you can have that sort of languaging, that sort 100%. of phrase that people think about now, not 10 how. times, 12 times becomes a little bit of a common motto. Then it comes up at a dinner conversation. It comes up at the bar. It comes up on a podcast or wherever it may come up. Yeah. Um, because it's just that poignant and that present and that common in a given day versus something that's kind of, you know, comes up once every month or something. I think the big thing that you're highlighting that I thought deeply about is how does 
how does every individual build more trust within themselves? Hmm. That's all this comes down to. How do I trust myself to move forward? How do I trust myself to take action? How do I trust, I'm trust, I said what I was gonna do, I did it. Mm -hmm. And when you say it like that, I think when you say, oh, I wanna be rich or I wanna be healthy or I wanna have a girlfriend or I wanna have, it sounds sometimes so intimidating. I never thought I'd meet an awesome partner. I remember my best friend, John Ross, he said, my wife is everything. She's like my best friend. She's like cooler than you. She's like fun to hang out. I'm like, dude, there's no way someone exists like that. And then you just kind of, you're like discouraged. Like, of course. It and then I met my partner after a long time of building up my confidence and feeling worthy and taking little steps of like going to a relationship coach and hiring other dating coaches. And over time you build up this trust in yourself. You're like, oh shit. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. No, having that contract with yourself is really important. I mean, I think a lot of people, yeah, they, they know what to do. They have the skills to do it. They just don't commit and actually just get the thing done. And yeah, it's tr I, I like that part of the book where you had people complete the contract. I was like, that is so freaking smart. And I was like, no, it's funny that you bring that up because it's, it's interesting when you read something and yeah, you don't totally think about all the testing that went into something. But I did take a screenshot of that part and I was like, that's so genius. Yeah, we had other parts there. The original part was a journal to, for you to go journal. Hmm. And it was through people, you know, we did in-person cohorts. That was the original of this book was in-person and no one followed up. No one followed up. And I was like, okay, why aren't you guys following up? It's like, oh, we're afraid. And so how do you help support, get that person excited? No, people are really excited to do things. Like no one has to be motivated to eat ice cream. No one has to be motivated to watch football. No one has to be motivated to drink. Like you're like, I'm going to go do these things. So how do you do that? Create that same environment for them. It's like, oh, cool. I'm going to do all this fun stuff to an outcome that's super beneficial to them. Totally. And so we did have an, another one and all these things it's, it's noticing like, are, is this a gimmick or is this actual, is this like a, uh, like cheap calorie or is it real substance? Is it an appetizer or entree? And so it was really noticing what people are doing and not doing and then adjusting accordingly. And, and that's how it goes in business. Like you look at our first videos as yours and you look at it in a year, it's like, yeah, you keep kind of noticing like, I'm going to try to do a thumbnail. I'm going to try a new thought title. Yeah. I'm going to try like long videos. I'm going to try short videos. And then you keep kind of, readjusting the product. Like we used to do these compilation videos asking Bitcoin millionaires, how you got rich. And they were like three minute sections of different people. And then we're like, what if we just made the whole video one person? And now you can see a lot of our videos are 30 to 45 minutes of one person talking. That's pretty unique. And they've done something that's interesting to other people versus these compilation videos. Yeah. I love that. Well, this is uh, the message to everyone listening in that, uh, you know, now, not how get after it, uh, go check out million dollar weekend unreal book, uh, something wow. that I wish I had in my hands Thank you. 16 years ago when I was thinking to get started, but not sure how to do it. And, uh, something that's even invaluable for founders that have been in the game just to, uh, sharpen the sword even more. So appreciate everything, Noah. Thanks for having me out here.